What causes inflation? Why does money fall in value? If we're going to answer the question, what causes inflation? And inflation, the steady rise in the price level over time, is really a steady fall in the value of money over time, not to do with the goods and services whose prices are going up, but instead to do with the value of money that is falling. If we want to answer the question, what is causing inflation? Then what we need to answer is what causes the value of money to fall? In economics, how do we analyze changes in, in market values? How do we try to understand why the values and therefore the prices of commodities rise and fall? We do that by looking at the market for that thing. So if we want to understand why the value of money changes, then we need a market for money. Well, this, this is going to present a challenge. We normally analyze the market for goods and services against money. So how are we going to construct a market for money? For example, what do we mean by the demand for money? When I ask students in my class, how much money do you want? I hear 1 million, 10 million, 100 million. Like, it seems that once, once they stop to think about it, it looks like your demand for money is is almost unlimited. So then I did the following experiment. I say, let's imagine that I gave you all of that money. Let's imagine that you just won the lottery and you have $100 million. What are you going to do? And there was no shortage of answers. Oh, I'm going to invest it in stocks. I'm going to buy a nice car. First thing is I'm going to get a nice house. Get a house for myself, get a house for my mother. Some of them said I would start a business. Now, this is peculiar because the first question was, how much money do you want? And I got these gigantic amounts. But when I actually asked them to imagine having that much money, the first thing that everybody wanted to do was to get rid of it, was to exchange it for other assets. They wanted to exchange their money for stocks. They wanted to exchange their money for a house, for a car, for a business. And that tells you that the demand for money is not actually unlimited. You are going to exchange any excess that you have for other assets and thereby end up keeping only a small fraction of your wealth in the form of money. Your desire for wealth may be unlimited, but your demand for the specific thing called money is actually quite limited and fairly small. Indeed, let's turn the question around. Let's go to the other extreme. Given the fairly obvious benefits of having an investment in stocks or having a business, a nice car, a nice house, then the question becomes, why do you hold money at all? Like, what's the point of holding money if it doesn't deliver any of the services and joys that the alternative assets do? Why do people hold money? Well, people hold money because money intermediates transactions. Money allows you to buy stuff. 
there was your regular spending. You know, you need to buy a lunch, you need to pay for transportation, whether it's a bus ticket or, or gas for the car. So your day-to-day -day transactions, you need money for. Whatever is the most popular form of money in, in your country. That's called the transactions demand for money or the transactions motive for holding money. And then it's also good to have money for the unexpected spending. Unexpected, unexpected spending might be a family emergency that requires the purchase of medication or medical care. Or it might be, you know, a one day sale at your favorite clothing store, which you see on the way home and you want to stop and pick up a bargain. That's called the precautionary motive for holding money. So there are other reasons for holding money, but the main ones are the transactions motive and the precautionary motive. So most of the reason for holding money is tied to spending. It's tied to having the ability to engage in transactions to buy goods and services. It follows, therefore, that the determinant of your demand for money is going to be the amount that you need to spend. So the volume of transactions is going to be one factor. You know, how, how many meals you have to buy for the day, how much transportation you have to do, how much phone credit you generally use, the volume of your daily consumption is going to determine your demand for money. If you have a higher volume of consumption, then you're going to need more money. And of course, the price of the goods and services that you consume. The product of the volume and the price tells you how much money you need for your daily and weekly transactions. If we scale this now to the level of the national economy, the whole economy, which is what we're interested in, then we have a measure for the volume of transactions that take place in an economy, and that is tied to real GDP. The amount of production, what is produced is sold. So the amount of real GDP is one macroeconomic determinant of the demand for money. Another one, by the way, peripheral to this particular discussion, but still important, is the rate of interest. Because for any volume of, say, monthly transactions, you can finance that by going to the bank once for the month and withdrawing everything you need to spend for the month which case your demand for money is great, or you can finance that by going to the bank once a week. Therefore, four times for the month and withdrawing only what you need a week at a time, in which case your demand for money is going to be less. So, and that's going to be influenced by the rate of interest. You know, if interest rates are, are high, then you want to leave your money in an interest earning account as long as possible, and so you you go to the bank more frequently. So that's just for noting. The main determinant we want to call attention to here is the price level. That for a given real GDP and a given rate of interest, there was going to be a proportional relationship between the price level and the demand for money. If the price level were to double, then whatever was your habit in terms of how much money to hold, that amount of money can now only buy half of the volume of transactions that you're used to carry out. In which case, if you're going to continue consuming at the rate you had been before, you're going to need twice as much money. So this proportionality between prices and the demand for money, your demand for liquidity,
for cash to carry out transactions is going to give us our demand for money curve. So to put together the market for money, we measure the quantity of money on the horizontal axis, let us say in, in billions of dollars. And on the vertical axis, where we normally put price, then we put the price of money. That is to say, what is the price of money measured in terms of how much it can buy? What is its value in relation to goods and services? And we're going to use the patty to represent all goods and services. So, if, if when the price of money, the price of a dollar, is one patty, the demand for money was $10 billion worth of money. Then when money, when the dollar halves in value, a dollar is only worth half a patty, which means patties are costing twice as much, then the demand for money needs to be twice as great, $20 billion, and so on. If the value of money falls to a quarter of a patty, the value of a dollar is a quarter of a patty, then the demand for money is going to be $40 billion. And in this way, we see that the demand for money curve can be approximated by a rectangular hyperbola. So that's our demand for money. We need a supply of money. For our purposes here, we're going to make the highly simplified assumption that the supply of money in the economy is determined with a fair amount of exactness by the monetary authorities. Whatever money supply they want, they can engineer to have. The real story is more complicated than that, but that's for another lesson. So, there is our market for money. We have a money supply, which is whatever the money monetary authorities want it to be, and so it's not upward sloping. They can pick whatever money supply and hit it. So it's a vertical straight line and a demand for money, which is a downward sloping rectangular type problem. The value of money, like the price of any commodity, is going to be determined by where the market turns, where the demand and supply curves cross. So in our example here, that happens where a dollar is worth half a patty. And if a dollar is worth half a patty, then the price of a patty is $2. Now look what happens if other things remaining unchanged, we increase the money supply. We double the supply of money. Then the market for money is going to clear at a dollar being worth a quarter of a patty. Same money demand, more money supply, so the value of money falls. And if a dollar is worth a quarter of a patty, then the price of a patty is $4. We have inflation. We get inflation by an unwarranted increase in the money supply without any corresponding change in the demand for money. An increase in the supply of money reduces the value of money, which manifests as higher prices. This is an important result. How it happens is not as important, but it's still interesting. How does a money supply increase prices? How does an increase in the money supply end up raising prices? Well, to put it simply, 
the economy can be represented as factors of production represented by the labor force um, as one of the main factors of production and the factors of production produce goods and services produce the range of goods and services produced in the economy so if the average pay to a factor of production is one hundred dollars then there's some kind of markup and return to the entrepreneur and so the average price of a good or a service is let us say two hundred dollars what happens if suddenly there is more money supply in in the economy economists like to call this helicopter money you increase the money supply by having the monetary authorities you know throw money out of a helicopter window well firms are going to try to produce more goods and services to meet the additional demand but that means engaging hiring more factors of production if the factors of production were previously fully employed and that increased demand for factors of production for labor all the firms are trying to hire workers away from each other is only going to result in rising wages and other factors of production production as well like rents and so on so if the cost of the factors of production rise and goods and prices have to be marked up above that then cost of goods and services is going to rise the prices of goods and services is going to rise so that's sort of how it happens so we have explained why is it we can get an episode of rising prices that if there is an unwarranted increase in the money supply then prices are going to rise but then we get to an equilibrium and prices stop rising so how do we get persistent inflation how do we get prices that constantly rise year after year well that must require a constant rate of growth of the money supply that is unwarranted and it is the monetary authorities that set a target for and sometimes may exceed their target end up having a growth of the money supply that is greater than the corresponding growth in the demand for money that gives you this persistent inflation year after year this explanation is called the quantity theory of money and it is appropriate for explaining inflation in the long run if we want to understand why over a 20-year horizon let us say some countries have higher inflation rate than others it doesn't help you to understand why inflation might be higher this year or lower this year changes in inflation from year to year can be due to many one-off events here we are trying to understand why persistent inflation is different in different countries so a country's long-run average rate of inflation is strongly influenced by the rate of money supply growth relative to that of the demand for money.